Hey everybody, so today we are going to be joined by a special guest, someone that I truly appreciate his no-nonsense, just tell it like it is personality on LinkedIn. And he also has a lot of really, really insightful pieces that I personally follow all about data and the things going on in the tech space. So today we're gonna to be jumping into how a lot of us are trying to maybe reinvent things that don't necessarily need to be reinvented, where some things that could be standardized are not causing us lots of other issues. And honestly, everything in between when it comes to data and building pipelines and architecture and all kinds of nitty gritty things. So if this sounds like an interesting topic to you and you are a big data and architectural nerd, this is the video for you. So without further ado, let's go get started. You had a post. <laughs> it's so I'll read what you wrote because I want to talk about this. Um, why don't houses fall down every day, but apps often sort of suck and we spend oodles of time talking about technical debt. Do we not build enough apps to get any better at it? And then you say there's a huge variety of homes, crazy levels of customization, economy of scale. How can we can't accept software as some kind of purely unique thing that requires the developers to reinvent light sockets? Right. So that's what you're talking about. So I um yeah that posed through some controversy. Yeah? Why? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know about controversy, right? But like, okay, here's here's the thing. You know, I and this is like oof, maybe really not popular with engineers. So I have to be careful about this <laughs> one. But like it, you know, I I um we use the engine, you know, we use software engineer. We use that title, I think, a little gallantly. Right. Like I've that work does a lot of work for some people. Mm -hmm. Um, I I, you know, there's other posts where we've kind of talked about that. And yes. and you know, what is it what does it mean to be an engineer? Right. Mm -hmm. Like if you go to the structural engineering Reddit, this is really mm -hmm. an interesting you go to Reddit, the structural engineering Reddit will ban you for giving advice. Oh, I didn't know that. As a stamped as a stamped engineer with liability insurance, you cannot give reliable advice over the internet. Like that is un that's irresponsible. It violates their code of ethics because they have mm, a written mm -hmm. code of ethics because they're that. engineers. They have people's safety on the line all the time. Yeah. That's engineering, right? I worked mm -hmm. with medical device engineers, mechanical engineers, mm -hmm. biomedical engineers, right? Like we are- I used to be in aerospace. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. are testing things to make sure they won't hurt people. Yes. We are proving it. We have scientifically based sampling tables yep. to define statistics. There are specs relevance. and standards and regulations that you got to follow. Right. Yeah. This is engineering, right? Yep. And yep. here's a weird corollary. The more like engineering and standards and things in a field, in some ways, the, the kind of higher volume you can get, mm -hmm. contrary to belief, the higher diversity you can get in output, the higher creativity, right? Like you can get more cool things faster mm -hmm. if you have more standards and controls. If you, what the, how does that work, right? It's like the bumpers, right? When you're playing, when you're really bad at bowling, get the bumpers up and so you can do all kinds of cool stuff. And, and again, this one's challenging for engineers, right? Because we want to be creative. Mm -hmm. We like to invent things. We talk about engineering as a creative pursuit, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But like, not everything ought to be. You know, <laughs> some things we, just need to work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, some things you just don't invent that, right? And, yeah. and, and, it's, and it's funny because as engineers, like we say that we appreciate this and we appreciate reuse and whatever. And then you go, hey, what are you building? And they go, oh, this thing that somebody else already built, yeah. right? Um, I just- Or I'm to... using the standards, but I've customized it in this 20 million ways. It's like, mm, is it standard in Yeah. <laughs> I, and people talk about like, and so, so as long as you think about software and every piece of software, so let's talk about like, okay, so in the old days, in the olden days, we mm -hmm. would talk about software and kind of common was sort of an end tier architecture mm -hmm. we talked about, right? So there'd be a fat client, maybe it was a browser, right? But it's more fun mm -hmm. if it's a fat client because we did have state management problems back then. It wasn't mm -hmm. just now. And then there's some kind of, you know, calculation server middle tier. And then we've got some, some sort of data storage, right? Mm -hmm. You can reinvent all of those things, right? Like choice is awesome and you ought to make a decision, mm -hmm. but let's assume I've got three things to choose at each layer, mm -hmm. okay? 
So I've got this combinatoric potential mm -hmm. complexity of how I'm going to build this thing. Mm -hmm. And again, kind of in the old days, right? It was like, I want to do Java on the client because it's mm -hmm. going to hit a bunch of different OSs or I'm going to just go after Windows. And so we're going to mm -hmm. do some Sharp or something mm -hmm. like browser-based apps where you mm -hmm. can find web pages or whatever. And, you know, similar on the database side, right? It was kind of all relational. Yeah, at go that point, one. yeah. Yeah, go pick one, right? Um, data modeling, it's, you know, a fair bit easier, right? Like kind of everybody knew what normal forms were. Mm -hmm. And... You know, for better or worse, a lot of really reliable, useful software that still powers the universe was built during those times. Yeah. Okay. So we could talk about like, oh, well, an Oracle database doesn't scale to infinity or blah, blah, blah. So we should use some fancy whatever. But like the fundamentals of building <laughs> the app are not, right? Mm -hmm. I got a, I got an RFP uh, in the relatively recent past, you know. And people talk about, you know, it's a similar post related to this one, right? Like really, because mm -hmm. our brain was in the same space. I'm talking about the ability to estimate software. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm going to build a house. And I built a building in the last few years. And, and to be clear. <laughs> you I know designed, what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Like, so I designed the thing. I drew hand drawings. I put some dimensions together. And then I had to have a draftsman actually draw it. So I had to go mm -hmm. to a guy who's got, you know, essentially architecture credentials, mm -hmm. and engineering credentials. Mm -hmm. He understands local building code. Mm -hmm. Then I've got to go to a general contractor, right? Like he knows the building codes. You can't get a building permit unless you have a licensed contractor yeah. on the permit because they don't want just jackasses doing whatever they feel like yeah. saying they built a building because you kill yeah. people. Yeah. Okay. yeah. No, you have to have some vague qualification, right? Yeah. Okay. By the way, the, just because he's the general contractor. Now, if there's roofing done, somebody's got to mm -hmm. have a roofing license. If there's plumbing yep. done, somebody's got to have a plumbing license. If there's electricity done, somebody's yep. got to. Those are. I live in New England. Getting anything installed here takes at least twelve people. <laughs> separate, yeah. Now, I, I mean, I literally just had some plumbing done yesterday. It's beautiful, because um, <laughs> the guy like knows what he's doing. Yeah, right? now, exactly. He's got nine different choices about how to do it, right? But I started with plans. Here's the, I know the shape of the thing. I provided requirements. Mm -hmm. I iterated with the architect and the engineer. I iterated actually with the building department. Turns out I couldn't build it exactly where I wanted. I had to move it eight feet. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go talk to the landscaping, right? Like, so there's, man, this sure sounds like planning and a piece of software. Yeah. As we started building it, I was watching it in progress. Mm -hmm. I'm watching through it. I'm starting to logically use yeah. it. And I started filing change orders. You know what? Mm -hmm. I'd like to upgrade this. I wasn't going to paint it, but I decided it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Okay. The funny thing is that the whole time we had a schedule, mm -hmm. right? Like we started with the drawings and we said, look, give it. And this is, this is, again, we talk about like, oh, software is like art and it's unimaginably complicated. <laughs> and it's like, that is such garbage and not true. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, here's the general size of the thing. I need yeah. a mobile app. I got some requirements, right? I've got yeah. a barn that I'm going to build. I've got some requirements. We're yep. going to iterate. And the better we iterate, the closer the builder was able to tell me the cost, mm -hmm. the more exact we're able to understand mm -hmm. the timeline. Well, you we need to understand your use case too, right? Like how many plugs do you need? How, you know, like all of that needs to be thought out because of what your needs are. I, I drew a hand-drawn map of where I wanted to put all the stuff in the building. Mm -hmm. And then took it to the electrician so that he could use that to plan and provide his quote, mm -hmm. right? And, and he came back and told me, hey, did you think about this? Did you think about this, right? Mm -hmm. Just like a good engineer would do, mm -hmm. right? Like, this is what we say. You get the requirements from the user. You look at them and you go, hey, based on my expertise and experience, yeah, I would suggest maybe we think about this or this. Go, oh, great. Wouldn't so it be funny like if that, that user, if you went to that electrician and said, I know you have all this expertise, but I don't think that's going to work. Those you guys, hear that all the time. <laughs> professional contractors fire customers like that. They just walk <laughs> off the job. Yeah. And, and it's too funny, much trouble. Software engineers do the same thing. What do they complain about? People in the business who want to tell us how to pick technology, quit telling me how to do my job. You tell me what you need. Yeah. Don't tell me how to do it. Right. Yeah. It, Anybody who watches this and then is like managing a, a home improvement project, like is going to think a lot more about how they yeah. deal with the contractors. Yeah. Right? So I got an RFP and they said, hey, man, we think it's about two years. And here's 300 well-described features. 
How much is that? And I mean, yeah. time, cost, scope, quality. You pick a general architecture, then you iterate through the features. Yeah. You categorize each feature by where it goes in the architecture. This is like, like I knew a guy who 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 used to do project management for building like buildings, commercial mm -hmm. buildings. Mm -hmm. And we he took me to this parking garage. He was building this 10 deck garage. Wow. Mile away, driving towards it. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at the side of the building and he says, we're a few hours ahead. He and can I can tell because I know where the cranes are supposed to be. You've mm -hmm. never seen a Gantt chart like this guy had on the wall of his office. <laughs> it was insane. Yeah. Okay. They're managing like 500 people on the job site. You know, isn't this, this I, you know, when you're saying this right now, like I have so many projects I've been on that's a pipeline and everyone's like, oh, well, pipelines are the worst to work on because there's so many dependencies. And I'm thinking to myself, now as you're going through this analogy, that's actually real life, the, the the dependencies in a building with the people and all the other things that you have to take to consideration is way more complicated than the pipeline that goes from the street to your faucet, which is all <laughs> the pipelines are that I, I deal with. They're complicated pipelines, don't get me wrong, and they're very important pipelines. But what you're talking about, I think, is a little bit more complicated. So it's it's so interesting to like think through when I hear people talk about pipelines being so hard to do because of all the dependencies. But then I think about how many more dependencies do you have when you're building an entire building, not just the pipeline. <laughs> now, let me throw one more thing in here. In order to build one of these things, we've got to get the best top-notch engineers so that they can all be perfectly creative and invent all this stuff. Well, and when you get too creative with things, to, to your point about standards and, and having specs, I live in a house that's over 200 years old. My stairs to my second floor are so steep and they're so weird as me as a human in the modern world where I'm used to the normal standardized steps going up. And so going up the stairs to my house, I'm constantly tripping. Why am I constantly tripping? Which, by the way, this was a, a, a main issue in Victorian England, I heard, too, where the steps were all different because there was no specs. And so people were tripping all the time because your brain mm -hmm. starts to get used to the, the the standardization of things. Yeah, building code is a real thing for a real <laughs> reason, right? Yeah. And so, you know, then you think about, like, the variation in houses, yeah. You know, you can go to a tract builder that's built hundreds of houses that are very, very similar. And you can go on the app store and go look for like image filtering apps and how many image filter, right? Like <laughs> there's a bazillion of them. Yeah. I mean, the app store is like, so don't tell me you can't, you know, but, you know, the corollary keeps going. You can use steel studs or wooden studs and the, the the designer and the builder and which ones are cheaper in this area. And do I have any, do I have people mm -hmm. who know how to do steel or do I have to, you know, because only wood mm -hmm. guys are around here. Should I use Dynamo or relational database? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Like, should I use, you know, serverless or, yeah. or, or whatever, um, should we use JavaScript? Should we, you know, the, the number of programming languages, that are feasibly useful for app development, particularly in the middle tier, has skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. right? There's probably a, a solid 10 that you could say, hey, we built the middle tier out of X and, and people <laughs> wouldn't look at you like you were goofy. Um, there's still a few, right? Like if you did it in Perl today, people would think you were nuts and 20 yeah. years ago, that yeah. was a rapid yeah. decision. Um, but like diversity and choice causes a lot of problems. You know, yeah. you look at a lot of architecture diagrams today and there's this a lot whole, of snowflakes. <laughs> there's all these influencers too, who are like, Oh, we'll just do everything simple. Go back to the old days. Just do it on an EC2 instance. And it's like, well, that, that might not be the answer either. Right. Like yeah. maybe all of us living in a shed isn't the answer, <laughs> but it, do you know what the Windsor house is? Yeah. Are you familiar with the Windsor house? Right. Mm -hmm. That is the metaphor for a lot of software today. And I think cloud yeah. makes it easier. Right. Because because in the in the again in the olden days, we had to plan software. I planned this uh three year engagement one time, multinational, a little north of a hundred million. We hit like 97% of the planned milestones. We planned the entire program in 90 days and then hit start and hit the wow. vast majority of the milestones. I think we only blew the budget by like three percent. I mean, that's pretty good. Now <laughs> 
seven people engaged in full-time planning for 90 days. We flew around the world. Mm. We produced plans and models mm. that were thousands of nodes in the mm -hmm. spread, right? Like it was extensive planning. And then they had a project. That we hired a person to write macros because Microsoft Project wouldn't eat the complexity we wanted. So each track owner had their own project plan. Yeah. And then we had macros that would suck through them all and mm -hmm. create an Uber. <laughs> and that happened the almost every day. Yeah. And the CIO could see down to like everything. Mm -hmm. And it all worked. And and did we iterate? Did we swap out teams? Did we swap out systems? Right. Just like building a building. You know, mm -hmm. this contractor went out of business when mm -hmm. we, you know, we made the plan and they've since gone out of business. Oh, well, yeah. You could see that if you're doing good risk analysis, then you're seeing that 90 days out when you tried yeah. to light them up and they didn't answer the phone. Yeah. And you flagged it yellow in your regular risk meeting, right? Like you build software the same way you build buildings. We talk, or you don't. You go, hey, yeah. we built something. Maybe some people will show up. Some people show up and you go, oh, let's add a room. Instead of the Windsor, you get the Remington house. <laughs> right. <laughs> Stairways to nowhere. Right. right. Yeah. So, so I see help? where you're going with this. Like it's, it's, it's really, I mean, there's the, nobody wants to live in one of those giant cookie cutter neighborhoods either where everything ex is exactly the same. But the point is, I think what, what your earlier statement on, well, if you, but, but you can get really creative if you have like the right foundation. And if the right foundation is the easier part to, to pick up and move because you are using standards, you're using like best practice on, on whatever it is, it's a lot easier to then iterate off of it and do something different if you really wanted to. Yeah, yeah. And it's easier to find people to build. It's easier to find, you know. So oh, isn't that the case? There's so many search engines I've I've experienced over the years working in search where it's so beautiful search engine and it's all homegrown. Um, and these are usually smaller companies, honestly, small to mid mid-sized companies. Not the, the larger ones are using a lot of the commercial ones and then iterating off of it. But you know, there there was a major company. They created this from scratch crazy convoluted search engine that was never meant for search. And now 15, 20 years later, they have no idea how to get it out of their systems. And so they are falling behind because their search engine is so unique and custom that they can't update it. They can't modernize it. They can't do anything with it. The bane of uh, of software architecture, I think. And, and I do want to talk about that as a, as a thing, right? Like my arguments, some of my arguments, a, a lot of what I think about and argue and talk about sometimes can be a little bit uh, irritating to the individual engineer. Um, you, you know, can't when I make was, everyone happy. <laughs> well, no, I mean, the reality is there's a natural tension in the universe, right? Like I picked up a hammer and started, you know, driving nails when I was like 14. Um, like I helped frame houses mm -hmm. um, as like a 15 year old mm -hmm. and, you know, did roofing, right? It's just a thing. And, um, the way I looked at doing my job and thought about my work was different than the way the boss did. Mm -hmm. That's just yep. reality, right? Yep. And, and software is the same way. Software engineering is the same way. I spent a lot of time as an individual developer. I've gone mm -hmm. back to it more than once, right? Like I try to I, I try to not inflict upon people the mm -hmm. you know things that I wouldn't enjoy or wouldn't do myself, yeah. right? And yeah. as an architect. You, you have to like constantly try to get back close to what you're telling people to do, right? Because sometimes yeah. you're telling them to do something they're like, that oh, sucks, right? Mm -hmm. Again, there's a great corollary in building materials, <laughs> you know, because they release new building materials and new techniques. And then you go on the job site and you ask the people who are installing it and they go, oh yeah, like 20% of the tiles break. Mm -hmm. Shit, that's not going to work, right? Like yeah. we got to do something that's not yeah. going to work. Right? Like if the developer's, you know, hey, this programming language, you know, we keep getting weird crashes or we can't control memory and this is a memory. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, from an architecture standpoint, th the constraints aren't, you didn't understand the constraints, you didn't, you, so, but there is this interplay of, from a top-down standpoint, mm -hmm. constraining where the engineers can be creative. Yeah. 
is, is a critical part of it. And then, in, and then in software architecture specifically, right? You know, you, you, we talk about build versus buy. Yeah. And it's not binary. It's a continuum and it exists through multiple mm -hmm. layers of components. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly complicated. It's just a thing to keep in your head, kind of. But then there's the worst one, which is once I have a thing that's working, how much is it worth fixing it? Mm -hmm. And when do I say replace it? Mm -hmm. And entire companies have crashed because they chose replace it. Yeah. Like, replace it is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is that it's what engineers will always suggest. Like if you, if there's anything that I argue about with engineers, you go, hey, what's going on? And they go, oh, well, this part of our system doesn't work very well. Yeah, oh, cool. What are you doing about it? Oh, we think we should go replace it and go build this brand new shiny thing. <laughs> okay. How much of the existing thing is not working very well? Oh, there's like 3%. Okay. I get that it would be more fun and it would scratch <laughs> your creative outlet, right? Like yeah. everybody likes to build a new thing. Yeah. But if only 3% of this one isn't working, like, isn't the appropriate job to figure out how to fix that? And well, within reason though, because like, just like you were talking about with building materials, like you, maybe, maybe your, your, uh, building material is so old that it's not safe anymore. Right. Like there's, there's like pieces that you have to think about with that. Right. So that's the hard part. Yeah. When do you decide to replace X when mm -hmm. X is some, and I mean, I'm in this conversation right now with some people, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, there's this critical component. We rely on it. Mm hmm how do you decide when to replace that, right? Like to your previous point about, oh, well, we we probably scaled this thing two years past what we should have, <laughs> yeah. right? Like we, we can all stand here and that's the, this is the most irritating, right? And I, I, the sunk cost fallacy is a big yeah. thing that I bring up, right? Like, but it's, I mean, the flip side, a, a company that I'm deeply familiar with has this system that's written in a programming language mm -hmm. and, and, and it's so old, runs mm -hmm. on big iron, right? Like IBM, big iron stuff. And like they went through and replaced tons of like the ERP layer mm -hmm. and left this in place for a huge part of like the operational manufacturing mm -hmm. layer. Mm-hmm. And it was based on some really rigorous cost analysis. And, mm -hmm. and the fact of the matter is, you go, hey, that's a 40-year-old code base and a whatever and blah, blah, blah. And you go, yeah. And it does a billion dollars a year with four engineers that yeah. watch it. Yeah. But isn't there isn't there also an issue with that? Because I that same search engine example that that I, I just mentioned, they also are facing that those four engineers are now close to retirement and nobody wants to learn that code because they can't get a job anywhere else doing it. When do you make, I mean, I think about like, there's huge companies out there that are dealing with this at scale, right? Like I think about insurance companies and banks, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, that for years just ate COBOL programmers in droves and have been literally running you know, modernization efforts for the last like 15 years. Yeah. Um, they're never sexy, right? <laughs> they're so risky. I, I, I wonder, you know, to our conversation earlier about like social media and attention span, right? Like yeah. those kinds of programs. In my experience, the leader who gets all the credit for kicking them off is almost never there to see him finished. Oh, for sure. For sure. And that is its own, right? Like that's its own, right? So you start, you kick off a modernization effort and you get all the glory and laud for getting permission to spend the money, essentially. Yeah. And then but they peace out before it gets hard. <laughs> yeah, a year later, that's not sexy anymore. A year yep. later, it's just grinding and we've yep. run into some challenges yep. and- yep. And the business is, you know, it, was, it was interesting to me in, in multiple like multi-year programs to yeah. watch the organization get like change fatigue, Yeah, get, right? Like it, 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 it happens, mm -hmm. you know, you talk about, oh, we're going to, we're going to be in this brave new world 
three years from now, right? And 18 months into that, people yeah. are just tired of hearing. Well, not them. just that, but okay, what if you get to the end of those three years and you did it su successfully? Great. But so much has changed. So much so, like with like all the AI going on right now, the thing that you were building, let's say five years ago, and now you're complete is actually completely invalid with what exists in the world today. Like it doesn't happen often. Don't get me wrong. Like if you're building yeah, yeah. to code, building to spec, you know, okay. So instead of using um, some, some kind of oak, you can use some other type of wood. Like, okay, do you really need to worry about that? No, but like, if we can now build houses on water, like, wait, what? We can do that now? What? Yeah, so, so there is this like, interesting predicate about, are you being asked to build something truly unique? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where, where is this use case demanding uniqueness? And, and I think mm -hmm. the challenge that I see is a lot of times engineers say, oh, they asked for a house. Let's figure out how to build on water. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and they cool. didn't ask, yeah. they didn't ask you to figure this out. Right. Like I, <laughs> I was having a conversation with an engineering manager a while ago and they said, oh, well, we're going to start doing stuff in this new programming language. So why? Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, well, because the team really would like to learn it and it seems like cool stuff. And I'm like, that's no good reason to add it to your ecosystem. Yeah. Right. Like poly, like adding another programming language to an ecosystem is one of the scariest, most dangerous things yes. you can do. I, I was manager. in a situation with that where there was a, a developer, brilliant. He was among a, a small group that invented a new programming language. And so he wanted to use it in this project that was a huge overhaul. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, who else knows this language? Nobody. Okay, so we're literally gonna have to train everyone. All of our systems will have to change. Wh why was that suggested? Why was this that is terrible, suggested? This is a terrible idea, this, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and this is the challenge, right? Because we, we want to reward creativity mm -hmm. and as engineering managers, right? Like we want to talk about like, oh, I want you to be creative. But the reality is like, I want you to be creative in some pretty tight bounds and yes. you probably should get control of way less of those. You don't get to invent light sockets. <laughs> you yeah. might get feedback on where they go. Yeah. Right. But you don't, you don't get to, into, there's a bunch of stuff that like. Well, and you can, you can get creative of where the placement is to help innovative ways of solving the, the use case. Like that's for sure. Right. But yeah. Do you need a totally new way of doing light sockets? And sometimes like the answer is too, is like, Hey, I, uh, again, like everything, you know, nothing is absolute. Right. Cause sometimes like I've done these big multi-year things but those were never one piece of software, right? Like exactly. they were always, you know, frankly, I got really interested. You talk about like people who have esoteric skill sets, right? Mm -hmm. Like I got very interested in the space between the systems. I got very interested mm -hmm. in system of system architectures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so thinking about classes of systems and how they integrate mm -hmm. and it's so much fun, right? Yeah. But there are so few companies that have problems at that scale. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, yes and no. Right. But like, so, so I learned a ton of stuff about data architecture and master data management and hierarchy management and system because the company I worked for would buy like five other companies a year. And we were constantly in it. Like we had an entire, yep. I worked on the procedures that did master data onboarding. So when we would yeah. go buy you, here's the schedule for how we're going to suck your data yeah. assets in and how we're going to do bi-directional yeah. integration in these critical processes. Yeah. And like, there's a way you have to do it at scale, right? Yes. And you know, how many companies have 12 CRMs yeah. that are like functional and need to be remaining? Probably too many is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, probably too many, right? But like when I think about like jobs and, and skills and where do you go work, right? It's yeah. like, no, you're, you're Fortune 2000, you're Fortune 5000 maybe, right? Like to get to these like real mm. system of systems, yeah, right? Because it yeah. was always, you know, people think about 
this is probably like the biggest myth or or sort of misunderstanding I think in in IT in general is that that any of these big companies like have their shit together. Oh no, they don't. They at all. Yeah. At all. Like if you're a huge if you're a Fortune 500 in the United States, you've grown through a series of acquisitions and it's almost impossible that you actually onboarded and absorbed all those operating systems. Yeah. Right? You have multiple ERPs. If you're a manufacturer, mm -hmm. you definitely have multiple PLMs because I've been involved in global PLM harmonization mm -hmm. and that takes a decade. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Like yeah. if you put millions of dollars behind it, it takes a long. So yeah. every huge company, as soon as you like peel the onion, it's just layers of systems of systems. Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. looks, I mean, Snowflake is maybe the right, but it kind of looks like a fractal. Yeah. It, you know, there's like financial control layer and there'll be yeah. a product control layer yeah. at the central. And then you'll go to this region and they'll have their own little yeah. hubs and you'll yeah. go out to, the, you know, and if you do business in Brazil, like they'll have their own systems because there's yeah. a whole bunch of stuff in Brazil that from a right, like it's, it's apparently so hard to configure SAP to do Brazil and the rest of the world that many companies just give Brazil a separate instance. Yeah. Like well, as a at least resistance. Right. Like, is it really worth going through and trying to figure out how to do SAP in Brazil if everyone else is just doing a separate instance and it works? And, just fine? and making the two work together, like from a regulatory yeah. standpoint, or is it easier to just separate them and do all of it with like intercompany trading? Yeah. And I remember talking about, you know, like ERP rationalization initiatives and <laughs> you go, oh, yeah, except this one. Yeah. And, and then you find out like people who have done this really well and set the example for it. Yeah, that's how they did it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, but I mean, just that idea is this, it, it's why I kind of, I, I left that job and went into like cloud data platforms, right? Yeah. Was because we're having conversations about things that span years, mm -hmm. right? Like we're going to talk about like these systems. And I mean, just the customer master data flow across all the CRMs and through the yep. ERPs. I mean, that's where it ends up going, right? Like there's so many of these modernization and lift and shifts and, you know, trying to give one file system or whatever it is to rule them all, one CRM to rule them all. And what ends up happening, at least in my experience, is somebody says, okay, the first thing we need to do is map how these things connect together. And everyone goes, couldn't we just query across that mapping? And then it stops. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you do. And then you just keep doing that over and over again. <laughs> Not yeah. suggesting that's where you should stop, but that's where it usually happens. Yeah. I mean, but there is a, it's really hard, right? Because there's yeah. a, there's a, there's a real cost to rationalization. There's a real cost to centralization in yeah. lack of speed, right? Like these things yeah. seem like easy conversations, but even in a little organization, it's big. Contemplating, you know, and, and again, like we don't, from an engineering standpoint, I don't know that we often talk about like process architecture, mm -hmm. process maturity with nearly the rigor that we need to, right? Because I always think yeah. about, you know, people, process, information, and technology. And, and engineers, we talk a lot about people and we talk a lot about technology. And we kind of now people are talking about the information models, like data modeling might start to be sexy, a little plug, I'm making a data modeling tool, modeler.neuronsphere.io. Um, on, on the honest review series in, in December. Don't worry, we're getting there. Okay. <laughs> well, good. I've got time between now and December to like make it fancier. There you go. Um, so, <laughs> oh, you totally distracted me there. Sorry. <laughs> You're talking about data modeling becoming sexy. Yeah. But, but we don't talk much about process, right? Yeah. And process maturity. And, and, you know, the easy metaphor that I always like to go to is restaurants, like mm -hmm. instead of buildings, because buildings are kind of complicated. People don't think about the fact that it's all process control, even though it doesn't look like it. Mm -hmm. Think about restaurants. Um, I go to McDonald's occasionally because it's not good for me. But <laughs> when I go, I go for consistency. Mm hmm. The only reason that they get consistency is because it's just the most insane level of process control yep. that you can conceive of. Supply chain control, the product should come out bulletproof, beautiful, yep. right? Yep. Consistent. Now, we can argue about quality. You know, mm -hmm. Okay, well, I want something way fancier. I have to go to the other end of process control. 
-hmm. So the far end of process control is an amazing chef. And, and there's a place like this locally mm -hmm. where there is no menu. The menu is whatever the whatever dude they, did yeah. to cook that night. Mm -hmm. They've only got about 30 seats in the entire place. Mm -hmm. And he cooks for 30 that night. They kind of do it family style. Yeah. He'll make five or six different dishes and they go around the tables and him and it's mm -hmm. people line up down the street. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's the opposite of process control. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. You can't get the same thing twice. No. And well, and you could find something you really you like. Want. And, and it, you don't get it the same way if he does make it twice or she makes it twice. The reality is we want software to be somewhere in between one shot chef, mm -hmm. right? Single programming language that one dude invented <laughs> somewhere between that and McDonald's. <laughs> somewhere in the middle is the right amount of engineering creativity yeah. and the right amount of process control and the right amount of, so you know what? No, you can't choose your own programming language. Like that would take the CEO to sign off. Mm. But within your own programming language, you have three different architecture choices you can mm -hmm. choose. Mm -hmm. right? It's all however about many libraries, however you want to configure it. Yeah. yeah. It, it's about choosing and, and, and building code and setting building code for a city. Right. Like this is an interesting mm. correlate too. I'm gonna pick on Houston a little bit, but like, man, you can have a chemical refinery next to a hospital in Houston because they have no concept of zoning. And they're like, oh, it makes an eclectic experience. And it's like, it makes an insane experience. Yeah. And then you can go to other like much more planned places. And they're like, no, no, no. Buildings in this area need to match this kind of criteria. Buildings mm -hmm. in this area. No, you can't build a, a 10 story tall skyscraper in the middle of a residential neighborhood because it would look yeah. stupid it would screw the traffic up right and so you you can buy a lot here and you can build mm -hmm. but we're going to set constraint that metaphor from an enterprise architecture standpoint works really well we used to use that when we were sort of mm -hmm. multinational whatever right like hey mm -hmm. look you we got to give you a lot of room a because we don't understand all your context but b mm -hmm. because like if we don't give you some wiggle, this is the really irritating part as an engineering mm. leader. If I don't give you some wiggle, I don't get any creativity. Or they go around things and build things way off and where you Yeah, yeah. So those just like it's it's the the inspiration for that post was really this blurry idea of <laughs> I think we could probably build. Like, I've, I mean, I think so Neuron Sphere as a platform is a demonstration of it, right? Mm. Like with a very small number of people, we built something very, very large and we did it because we used a very comprehensive set of interlocking standards and conventions mm -hmm. and architectures. And it's a proof of like extreme scale if you do that. Yeah. And it's just like building houses. If you wanted to build a whole track to homes, you would start with all these processes and tools and whatever. Yeah. But anyway. to your point, uh, a lot of people kick back on that. Like data governance is a very similar thing where, you know, if you're in a highly regulated space like finance or insurance or something or healthcare, you have, you know, you have to follow those data governance policies or you're going to get audited and you're going to get fined and you're going to get in a whole lot of trouble. But then on the other side of the spectrum are the folks that are like, I work in a fashion and it's a creative outlet. And so therefore, you know, we don't want data governance. We, we need to be able to like make this unique to this, you know, boutique or something. And it's like, yeah, but now nobody can find it or understand what your data is. So what did you actually do? <laughs> right? I, I think there's a whole series of posts on trying to figure out how to lie to people about data governance. Like, what are the, maybe that's the new post, right? Maybe that's oh, no. the discussion we have. It's like, what are the lies that we tell people to get them to do data governance? Oh my goodness, that's using so true. the words yeah. data governance. Right? That, I don't want to say we lie, but we do We do need to, oh, you know, the the easiest one that I've heard and, and I know a lot of people use is just don't call it data governance. Just like, don't call it an ontology, call it something different, call it a network. And everyone's fine with it. Just don't call right. it an ontology. <laughs> okay. Uh, That's right. what it is, but okay. We had a data, we ended up calling it like the data definition club. <laughs> I'm not joking. 
and we met like once a week <laughs> and it was crazy. People were like asking to come to the meeting. They're like, That's so you funny. Have a, we have you had, a, we heard you had a club and I'm like, we have like dudes in their forties in a, in a conference room. It's not a club, but like <laughs> calling it like a data governance committee. I remember I floated and the VP was like, That's garbage and no one will ever participate. And I'm like, club? That people did. Yeah, it's just a rebranding of, of what it is. I, I don't know, like maybe it's the terminology of governance, like, well, you're putting governmental constraints on my data and it's mine. It's kind of like, get off my lawn. I don't want to listen to the federal government kind of people. I guess. I mean, it, people, I think you hit the head on the nail on the head though, right? Like we, I, I was in a meeting just literally the other day and we were, the guy kept talking about guidance yeah. And I'm like in Slack, like, like I, I, the word is governance. It's not yeah. guidance. Like yeah. we are not providing guidance. Guidance. Oh, I got slammed for call, saying, well, we need to be in compliance with our govern our data governance standards. And they were like, don't say compliance. Like, but that's the word. Are you complying or not? <laughs> yeah, that's the word. We have to use the right words or, or nothing. Right. Like, and yeah, yeah. I, governance scares people, I yeah. think, but there's there's a lot of uh, uh, there's value in the constraint. Yeah, I think that's the the key to all of this, right? I think that you made this point very early in the conversation, and maybe we can end with with you know solidifying that point, which is constraints don't mean that you go on autopilot and you don't have control over your own stuff. It means you are giving a bounded context where there are certain expectations that are set forth that have been decided are best for the business or best for the use case or whatever it might be. And then you can go hog wild inside of that if you want. Um, but now you, you're, you, we know the basic outline of what you're doing because we have given you those constraints, right? And, and I think that's what we're saying here. And we can objectively measure and say that it's not useful to go outside of that right now. Yeah. Right? Like that we, we and, and yeah, I, I think you summed it up really well. Right. Like that. How do we how do we create that balance? Yeah.